From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Promises of less work with more garden productivity often raise my suspicions as perhaps sounding too good to be true, except when the subject is no-dig gardening. The no-dig method of caring for our vegetable beds, which today's guest, Charles Dowding, has popularized, is not just good for maximizing output while minimizing labor, but also of great benefit to the soil and the greater environment. We'll learn more about how to get started in a moment from Charles, but first, these messages. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. Charles Dowding is often called the guru of no day gardening, which he practices today in his organic market garden in Somerset in southwest England. He began experimenting with no dig in 1982, and over the years since, in his many books and in person and online teaching, including his massive YouTube channel, Charles has brought countless people into the no dig fold. His most recent book is No Dig, and that's what he's here to talk about today making and managing a vegetable garden without tilling. Welcome, Charles. I'm so pleased to finally connect. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yes, and we're going to have a book um, giveaway with the transcript of the show over on awaytogarden.com. And um, I was delighted uh, to find names of familiar heroes of mine among the people who you credit as having provided you with early inspiration. And behind me on the bookshelf, if you could see our vintage copies of all of Ruth Stout's books. And I felt a Me Too connection also when you you wrote that you became a vegetarian decades ago and how that led you to explore organic gardening. Me too. (laughs) And and so, so yeah, so tell us, you know, this has been a, a a life, a a life path. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And, um, but I only got on it quite late. It feels like, you know, when I was at university, I was 20. So it took me a while to get there. Yeah. Um, So often the first task we have on the sort of to-do list for, quote, as soon as the soil can be worked, um, is to till, as we say here, till, and um, or otherwise turn the soil in our vegetable gardens so we can sow our peas or lettuce or other cool season things. Um, but I thought instead you could, to start, maybe give us the short pitch in favor of no dig about adopting that practice instead of turning the soil this coming season. Yeah, well, actually, the you know, autumn is the time to begin, if any time, in, in terms of what's getting ready for spring. So we aim to spread all the compost um, or whatever organic matter you're using for, for damp climates like here, particularly where slugs can be a problem. I find that compost gives best results. So we put that on the beds um, around an inch uh, before Christmas, generally. And then the, basically the ground is prepped. <laughs> and then uh-huh. What we do in the spring is we go out with a... A, 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 a hoe or a rake just to tickle you know very light disturbance of that surface matter to break up lumps which frost will have um, opened up if there were any lumps and also to disturb weed seedlings that might be germinating if you have weed seeds in your compost you know it's not a frightening thing people do worry about that I've noticed but yes. if you cut them small that lovely old saying we have in England is a hoe your weeds before you see them <laughs> Uh, and, that, and that's the ground prep in the in the spring. We we also sorry just quickly put um, a bit of wood chip on pathways, and you know basically that then all of the ground through the winter is is covered or mulched, and and if there's any mild weather, the soil organisms carry on feeding, and it's ready for spring. It's very quick prep in the spring. Yeah. So so that's a little p- bit of the ideal process if we were if we were started last fall and that's what I always do I top dress with compost in the fall before I kind of when I'm closing up the garden for the for the year and so forth so but like what's the what are the benefits I said a couple of of the things in the introduction briefly but this method really has advantages and and so the attraction to it has environmental um, uh, attractions but also and it minimizes some of our, our our workload. So just give us that little sort of pitch of of what it is that why we would want to try this. Uh, yeah, the biggest one is time saving. I reckon, like the the number of weeds which grow with no dig is so many fewer than you get when soil is disturbed. And then it's so interesting to wonder why. So you've got um, 
Nordic soil left alone, it's kind of calm. Uh, in, in here in the UK, we have a saying, chickweed follows the rotavator. Uh, I don't know if you call it chickweed. We call or... them rotatillers, and yes, we do have ch chickweed still uh, area. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we share a language, but so many words are different. And then, um, so disturbed soil grows weeds. You know, that, that's the other way of looking at it. With Nordic, you really get a few weeds. If you haven't tried it yet, you... Well, I reckon you'll be amazed uh, because your soil doesn't, you know, why do weeds grow? So weeds, weeds grow to heal soil of disturbance. They're part of the recovery process, um, literally in this case. And then other benefits of nodding is actually you get improved drainage. You know, it might seem at first counterintuitive because people think, well, I'm digging, I'm rotating, whatever. Um, that will open up the soil and improve the drainage. Actually, no, because you've caused a... You, you've got zones of different density and, and you've fluffed up the top, but you haven't changed the bottom. So the water makes a capillary boundary or layer when it trickles down through the top layer. And you actually end up with worse drainage. So we know that it's better drainage. It's very even all the way down. I think you get better temperature um, rising as well because you haven't broken the sort of um, zones at all. We notice that I've got two trial beds here and in the spring, uh, the no dig bed warms up more quickly and, or in the winter sometimes we'll see the snow melting on the no dig bed but remaining on the dig bed just for example Ooh, signs uh, of life in it it has signs it's got something yeah. living it's like underneath trees to you know underneath a big tree the snow melts around right. the, the sort of inner root zone first before it melts in the X outside the the perimeter of the, of the yeah, tree. It's so interesting, isn't it? All the things yeah. that we can learn just by watching. Uh, you know, that's one of the lovely things again about no digs. You're not, you're leaving it alone. You're not disturbing. So you, you can just look <laughs> and see what's going on. Um, when we're watering, the water goes in more easily. We've got the organic matter on top. It holds moisture more better. We find that, uh, you know, again, with my trial beds, I can see that in the summer, like last year was really dry. Uh, I don't water very much here. I've got a third of an acre of, of cropped beds. I'm selling a lot of vegetables and I've just got one a hose, me and a hose, because I just don't need to water a huge amount. Yeah. So let's sort of dig in, haha, -ha, to the how to a bit more. And you mentioned some of it uh, earlier, but you know, many of those listening to the program or reading the transcript already have vegetable gardens, but you know, they may be very well be starting the season, as I said earlier, by turning and tilling. And um, so if we didn't know this is what we want to start doing and we didn't apply our top dress with our compost in the fall, can we get started now in an established garden? And then after that, let's talk a little bit about first timers, you know, who 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 uh, mm -hmm. maybe want to start a new bed. But yeah, how, how would we get started if if we didn't do that top dressing in the fall? Yeah, really straightforward, actually. You, you can start a no-dig bed or no-dig garden at any time of year. And if it's going to be, in this case, probably then early spring, so you'll go out and the snow is melted and you've got ground which may or may not have weeds. So that's the first step is to work out how you're going to control the weeds because you're not going to turn them in or um, bash them around. Uh, if there's a lot of weeds, that's where the cardboard can come in, just as a one-off. It's not an every-year process. Uh, but often you could uh, hand weed or uh, lightly hoe and then put some compost organic matter on the surface. And that is it, basically. You know, there's nothing complicated about this. Mm -hmm. you know, what does that mean? It's just <laughs> leaving the soil alone as much as possible and, and feeding the surface so that soil life does the work for us. So compost, you've said a few times, and yeah. it struck me in reading the new book, No Dig, and, and some of your other books as well. When one is getting started, like say, for instance, I. I didn't have an established vegetable garden that I wanted to transition to no-dig practice, but I wanted to start a new bed or turn a bit of lawn into an additional bed or something. Yeah. The first time around, it seems like I'm going to need more of the this compost. I'm going to need a little more than I will need in subsequent years for sort of the maintenance of an inch or so top dressing, kind of, as I would call it. But so is that true? Is it in the the yeah, first like it, yeah? I, well, that's what I'd recommend anyway. You know, you you could start no dig with with just say an inch on on top of existing soil, uh, but mm -hmm. it'd be difficult because you haven't got that lovely depth of organic matter that's really soft for pulling weeds out of, and also for making your crops grow more. The way I look at it is, it's an investment in, in actually buy some compost at the beginning in the, in that first year to to lift the fertility significantly of your plot. And, and and that will carry you through many years to come as well. So, yes, I'd recommend buying some compost. Uh, we use actually as much as four to six inches sometimes on beds. Where some people find, well, is that a lot? I don't think so, actually, because we're, we're not using any other inputs. I'm not using any feeds or fertilizers. I'm not using any slug pellets. I'm not using any herbicides. I, I don't go into the store for anything 
except for one initial dose of compost. And then probably you'll find you can make enough for going forwards when you don't need so much. Right. Um, so, some, sometimes people say to me, well, I couldn't do no dig because I haven't got enough compost or it needs a lot of compost. And actually, that's not true. But it's, you might, <laughs> it's because of the way I present it, I think. You know, because I'm advising this higher amount at the beginning, which, which is basically, I think, just good gardening or good vegetable growing. Vegetables really respond to high organic matter in the soil. And what we're finding here with my dig no dig um, comparison beds, one I dig every December and, and one I leave alone, and they both have the same amount of compost. What we find is that the bed I dig actually gives 10% and sometimes let even more lower harvest compared to the no dig, which mm. means for the same amount of compost, you're getting less produce. In other words, no dig is really efficient way of using organic matter. And I think that's because of keeping carbon in the soil and all those other great benefits. Mm. So so if I had a, a piece of lawn I wanted to transition, I could mark off my area, lay down the cardboard, put the six inches or so of compost for this first time. And again, that means I probably are going to have to, although you haven't seen my compost heap, Charles, which is 40 feet long. Um, <laughs> a little okay, bit of a mad, right, right. a mad woman over here with <laughs> compost production. But at any rate, um, uh, uh, so, um, so I'm going to need um, uh, to do that. And then how soon can I plant okay, into well, this, that? Yeah, this is this is another benefit of the four to six inch dose that you could plant. You could make a bed like that on the first of March in the morning, and you could plant put your plants in on the first of March in the afternoon. You know, you haven't got to wait for the weeds underneath to die because your new plants or seeds, um, even carrot seeds, they're going to start growing in the surface compost, and then by the time they're rooting at deeper levels. Uh, the cardboard will be decomposing and the lawn uh, weeds or whatever it is underneath the cardboard will also be decomposing and the soil will be opening up for receiving the roots of your new plants. So this should, should it be moistened? Is that like, well, is yeah, there a watering that's... stage? Because I would imagine, you know, you don't want it to be sort of uh, yeah. repel the moisture or the, yeah. So it depends on the weather. You know, if it's a damp spring, then you, you, you won't need to water actually because right. if you're putting cardboard on damp soil, it very quickly softens and, and stays moist. But it, yeah, if it's really dry, then give it a bit of water. That really helps. If you use less compost, which is still possible, it just means that does increase the time before you can plant. And say you put only, say you put your cardboard on your lawn and then only two inches of compost, it's just physically quite difficult to get plants in the ground. The, the, there's not much compost to hold their roots. Uh, before they hit the carpool. So that, that's where the higher dose initially also comes in. Yeah. I, I was fascinated in uh, the new book, looking at the table of, uh, excuse me, the index in the back. You don't even have an entry for cover crops, which is sort of a, a hot thing here, you know, among vegetable, organic vegetable gardens, gardeners and so forth, and, and has been among farmers for a long time, is cover yeah. cropping, green manuring, you know, growing a legume or a brassica or something for a part of a year and then turning it in to improve tilth and fertility. And you don't even have, you don't even cover that because you're doing this top dressing thing. You're using the compost. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I reckon I'm conserving my compost through no digs. I'm getting more value from the same amount of compost. And I reckon it's better to um, crop a smaller area and do it more intensively. So I'm, I'm finding the compost, the one inch a year on, on this soil anyway, gives, gives enough fertility for two, even three crops a year. So we're, we're doing the second planting, if you like, or sowing is, is more vegetables, not a cover crop. So basically, like, gardens can be full of vegetables <laughs> and you, you haven't got time to sow a cover crop when you're going to grow it because, you, you know, like, as soon as the, the the onions are finished, we're planting some white cabbages or whatever it might be. Um, there's literally no growing time for, for growing a cover crop or green manure, and we don't need it, I find. So that's, that's why... Um, it's not exactly an omission, but it's a very interesting debate to have because I think I'm, I'm going to branch out a bit slightly different here. But yeah, I think cover crop comes more from farming. You yes. know, and I know this is language again, but in the UK, farming and gardening are two different worlds that don't overlap very much. And farmers are people who drive tractors, have herds of cows and sheep, and gardeners are, are people like us more who are cropping fairly intensively smaller areas. And cover crop seems more appropriate and applicable to me for farmers. Yeah. Um, the other, th so you just kind of uh, spoke to this a little bit, but I wanted to ask more. Um, you talked about, you know, having one crop following another and so forth. And you don't really um, uh, 
preach sort of the, you know, resting the beds or uh, mm -hmm. even crop rotation. You speak about this soil that's being cared for in this way, being able to stand up to and perform continuously um, and kind of intensively, yeah? Yeah, well, this is what I'm finding, Margaret, you know, the, the rapid replanting or even interplanting, which means you're overlapping the, you know, I'll pop kale between my onions, for example, and you, at first you can hardly see the kale because the onions are finishing growing for about a month. And then you harvest the onions and lo and behold, whoosh, you, the kale's already got its roots down and it grows away really fast. And it's it's what we're learning. It's related to your previous question, I feel, you know, the, the cover crop green manure thing. The, the, one of the understandings in that is that you want roots in the soil or plants growing as much as possible of the growing season. And in a way, the more roots you can have in there, the better, you know, within reason. <laughs> and, and so that's right. what the repeat planting and the very rapid replanting is doing. It, yeah, I think it's better for soil not to rest, actually. I think it, it, it wants, and the organisms in the soil, right, is the way to look at it. I think as they want root plant roots there all the time. Hmm. And so even if, and in terms of the sort of crop rotations, if you're growing well, tomatoes or other solanaceous things, you, you grow them, you, you can grow one after another year to year, or do you rotate that way, you know, for pest and disease maintenance? Or well, that's, yeah, again, really interesting question, because the, you know, with no dig, it seems that a lot of the what we've taken as rules um, become less less important. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's still truth in them, but rotation, from what I'm finding, is is much less important than it's been made out to be. And for example, I'm doing a trial. I'm always keen to, you know, if I want to test something, well, I'll try it out. And we've we've got now a piece of ground where I've grown potatoes this spring. I planted them for the eighth year in a row in the same place. And I come from a farming background where this was not the done thing. <laughs> so, no, no, I yeah, know. That was I a no-no. I no. myself to do is say, what am I doing? I'm putting in potatoes in the same bit of ground for the eighth spring in a row. And I grow second early so that they're harvested by mid-July. And then we can plant leeks after that. But every year I'm doing potatoes, leeks, potatoes, leeks in that same piece of ground. And this year, which was the eighth year in a row of potatoes, we had the best crop ever. And it was super healthy. And I'm saving my own potato seed as well, which, you know, again, we've been told not to do. So, yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to question things. I'd encourage your listeners to question a few things as well. Not everything. <laughs> but, you know, it's very healthy because because it gets you involved and interested and curious. And, and being curious is a really good state to be in. Well, I think what you're speaking to in all of these answers is that if your soil is vibrantly alive, you know, if it's really healthy, if the whole sort of, I don't know if it's a microbiome or what we would call it, but if that's really teeming with life and everybody in that community in the soil is doing its thing, there some of the rules are not rules anymore because the soil's able to 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 work that extra amount, right? I mean, to do, to yeah. provide the support. Yeah, that's a really nice summary. And so, you know, like in my book and my advice generally, what, what I'm wanting people to, to, the point I want them to get to is exactly that. And so that's the advice I'm giving how to how to start out, you know, and that's where the high romantic compost comes in at the beginning. And then just how to look after your soul going forwards. Do, are your beds always mounded up slightly? I mean, I, I have, a, I should backtrack and say, you know, I have maybe 35 years ago, I built raised beds. So I, I garden in raised beds that I don't till but um or or turn but but um so so mine would be an exception but if we they were not raised by walls wooden walls or stone walls or whatever do you always kind of slightly mound up the beds relative to the path level or what do you recommend that well, way not necessarily I, I would say that's only actually necessary if you're on boggy ground for okay whatever. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, in dry weather, actually, it can be an advantage to be not exactly level. But I like to have a slight man. It partly helps to see where the beds are. And also because we put a bit of wood chip in the pathway. And I don't really want too much wood getting in the way of things that are happening on the beds among the vegetables. So having the bed slightly raised helps. And that's where putting on a higher dose of compost at the beginning comes in. Uh, but, yeah, there's no it's not mandatory to have them raised at all if you don't want to. Mm. Um. In the new book, you uh, go into sort of a lot of crop by crop uh, recommendations as well. Are, are you, uh, this is a crazy gardener to crazy gardener, <laughs> lifelong gardener to lifelong gardener question. Is there something you're particularly obsessed with or in love with? Is there a group of crops that's your thing, Charles? Is there a, do, do you know I what do, I mean? I love alliums, actually. I, ah, I, 
<laughs> of all my vegetables, garlic is the favourite. I wouldn't be without my garlic. Like I, like, I eat some every day. I eat a little bit of raw garlic. In the Hard morning. neck or soft neck? What well, either. Of- uh, but do you know what we've been finding recently is the soft neck is more resistant to rust, or mainly because it crops a bit earlier in, in the summer, and then the hard neck catches rust. And I don't know if it's the same with you, but rust is becoming quite a problem here. And I'm hearing yeah. all over the world. I've been getting comments from New Zealand. I had a guy, a farmer from Uruguay, asking me on Instagram, you know, like, what can you do about rust? He said, it's just struck me for the first time. Interesting. Yeah. So, so the alliums, you, you like the alliums. I love the alliums and onions. Yeah. <laughs> all yeah. Year round. Do you, uh, now you, you're much earlier, your, um, your frost free season and so forth is much different from a lot of the Northern United States where some or many of the listeners may be. And um, like, for instance, my frost free date isn't until mid May or later. And so, you know, even my early season crops wouldn't go out until like April, late March or, or even mid April and so forth. But, um, yeah, but Margaret, Margaret, the, the, um, there's a thing there, which is that my dates are quite similar to yours, I think, actually. Oh. My, my, my last frost date is, is 15th of May, even oh. 16th. But what we don't have before that is loads of frost. So we've got quite see. mild temperate winters. And that's where these, these numbers can be difficult to assign, can't they? Zone numbers and that kind of thing. Because they don't give the whole picture. Like I'm zone eight here officially, but so is Texas. <laughs> you know, like the summers I get do not correlate with what happens in Texas. I'm a so, 5B. So, um, you're a 5B, right. Well, that, that's yeah. the same with Maryland, I believe, isn't it, for example? And all the no, I'm way up in uh, New York, the middle of New York State. Yeah. So I'm okay. up. Yeah. I mean, well, the upper I, it's only mentioned that because I know some people in Maryland. They, they came on a course here, actually. It was really nice to meet them and swap notes. Oh. And they, they they can use the same planting dates as as I suggest, just so you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I, everyone has to figure that out for themselves. And as yeah. you say, there can be sort of even microclimates within the zones and so forth. And yeah. There are. Um, so uh, what, what, what have you, what's sort of underway there? Are you seeding a lot? Is it a lot of indoor seeding now or what's, what's kind well, of? Well, no, actually, I, I've found over the years uh, that it's just not worth starting too early. You know, you can in theory, uh, but it just, and you end up with plants that are, too early for the conditions outside so i don't start sowing until roughly the middle of february i call it valentine's day you know love your garden <laughs> start uh-huh. Uh-huh. February. that just works it's nice time for sowing onions spring onions spinach lettuce um coriander early cabbage early cauliflower calabrese broccoli you know that kind of thing um the, all the frost hardy plants and then i don't sow tomatoes until roughly 20th march even sometimes mid-march and um, squash, cucurbits, and all of those mid mid April actually. So right, yeah. that's, that's you're right. That's about it's it's similar. Although I can have a lot harder frost uh, right. where I am, you know, in in the, in the yeah. early spring part. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. And I was just going to say, at the moment, we've got I've got salad onion, spring greens outside, um, looking quite healthy. Although we we had twenty degrees Fahrenheit this morning. You know, we do get frost, uh, yeah. but they're it's not hanging around perhaps quite as long as it does for you, I think. So My parsley we, made it all winter this year because we've had a very mild winter. So I've been enjoying my big parsley plants all winter, you know, picking off them. So that's been Isn't it a wonderful winter herb? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, parsley. it is. Coriander too. It just feels like you, you can't believe it's the dead of winter when you have that flavor, that burst of flavor in your mouth. You know, it's just yeah, amazing. Exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. they're sweeter, aren't they? Do you notice that? You know, with the totally cold. Totally. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to just ask you about the foundation of a lot of what we've been talking about, which is compost, compost, compost. So yeah. do you have any sort of tips for us, any advice for us on, I saw, in, I think it, I think it might be in, is it in the book or in the, in the website? I'm not sure. Um, you know, kind of like layering your browns and greens as, as we say, your carbon rich materials and your nitrogen rich materials. Do you have any sort of advice for us? Because that's the other thing that once cleanup begins, people are going to be adding to their compost heap. And I'm afraid I think people dump everything in big piles, you know, individual ingredients too much in one place and so forth. Well, I'm glad you asked that because also, I mean, I haven't really defined compost and I think it can be off-putting for beginners, you know, like what do you mean by compost even? And and for me, it's anything decomposed. So it might have been leaves, even we call it tree, leaf mold. Yes. At the beginning, uh, it com- might come from trees or plants or whatever, but it's organic matter that is reasonably well decomposed and not perfect. Like I had a guy come on a course here and he said, he said, I can't make compost. I want to find out how to make it. And after he's seen my compost heaps, which are not perfect, <laughs> he, said, <laughs> oh, he said, I'm doing all right. <laughs> and, and, you know, so it can be slightly lumpy. It can have bits of wood in whatever. So don't 
don't worry about setting the bar too high. But yeah, as you say, um, don't, don't be too random about it. But you can't be too scientific either because, you know, garden waste vary all the time. So just be aware of some basic principles like if you put in a lot of green leaves and especially grass clippings, then you need to add some brown fibrous material, which could be paper or cardboard, but also it could be tree leaves that you kept from the previous autumn, but woody prunies, that kind of thing. So for from during the winter, make sure you have a stock of what we call brown, which is the woody stuff in small pieces that you can add to your green that you're going to be putting a lot of in the summer. And that will help you to make more compost of a high quality. And yeah. we, we reckon to turn heaps once. I find that that's enough. I don't do any more than that. Um, but you don't have to turn a compost heap. But if you can turn it once, I find that makes a worthwhile difference. Yeah. Well, Charles Dowding, I'm so glad to connect. And um, as I said at the beginning, we're going to have a giveaway of your new book, No Dig, uh, with the transcript of this show over on awaytogarden.com. And I look forward to talking to you again. And thanks for, I mean, the YouTube channel alone is just such a, a treasure for so many, I would imagine, millions of people. So thank you. Thank you for all the the, the learning that we can do. That's lovely, Margaret. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Speak to you again soon. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. And I hope I'll speak to all the rest of you again soon, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com and on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and composting meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.